let me tell you what I hope to do this evening. First, I want to look at disasters generally and how we respond to them. Then I want to look at the particular disaster of this week and ask why is it so important, so significant? Why has it sent such a huge shockwave around the entire world? Then I want to look at the wider aspect, the broader picture behind this crisis, and then we'll have a little break and sing a song. And after that, I want to go to the Bible and first look at two passages which I was reminded of when I heard the news this week, and then to look at one very small thing that Jesus said which was so important that it will affect our attitude to people all the people involved in this crisis, the villains and the victims, and ourselves, who survived or who were not in it, and then finally to look at what this helps us to think about God himself. Well now, we'll define a disaster as an unexpected loss of life on a large scale. And history has been packed full of such disasters. There's hardly a week goes by without one. It keeps the newspapers busy because they know about our fascination with the details of every disaster. We have a morbid interest in finding out everything that happened. We never get used to disasters, but we always get over them sooner or later and settle back into our comfortable and complacent lifestyle afterwards. Now the response to any disaster goes through three phases. And we are not yet in the third phase tonight, though I'm speaking into that third phase. Stage number one, when any disaster happens, is shock. And our thoughts and our feelings are so paralyzed that we don't either think or feel anything. We are simply dazed. And when we are in shock, we want to be alone. We want to hide. We don't know how to handle relationships. So shock is phase number one. And that happened on Tuesday and Wednesday. Shock then gives way to grief. And that's phase number two. And that's when we want to be together. When solidarity with those who are suffering comes to the surface. When people gather in churches or anywhere where they light candles and put flowers in places. I've seen all that happening this week. So that's phase number two. The phase of grief. And that's a phase largely filled with feelings and feelings that need to be shared. And perhaps the most important thing in that phase is simply to stand with those who grieve and be silent. It's too early to start talking. But sooner or later, phase three begins and phase three is anger. It grows out of frustration that we couldn't stop it happening. And we want to do something about it if we can. But frustration and anger can lead to different reactions depending on whether it's rational or irrational. Unfortunately, after many disasters, irrational disaster leads us to unwise events. We take out our anger out of the wrong people. It is misdirected. We look for a scapegoat to blame. We want someone else to suffer for it because we have suffered in it. But that's the very point where we need to be rational and think very, very carefully before we do anything. President Bush is facing this exact situation right now, and he must think clearly before he acts, or the situation could be very, very much worse. So those are the three phases. The grief climaxed on Friday with the service at which our Queen attended and for the first time in her life sang the national anthem of another country. The service in the cathedral in Washington climaxed that grief for America and brought it to a head at which President Bush and Billy Graham both spoke. So the discussion is beginning and already the newspapers are asking the big questions. And I felt it was important that into that discussion we inject Christian questions and Christian answers because there will be many questions challenging our faith. The biggest question of all is why did God let it happen? 
And of course that question can only be asked if you already believe two things about God. Only if you believe he is all good and loving and all powerful on the other hand do you have a problem. If God is weak and cannot help these things happening then there's no problem. Or if God is strong but not loving is a bad God who is a sadist and who would enjoy hurting his creatures there is no problem. But to everybody who believes that God is both all good and all powerful there is a problem. And the question is inevitably asked, did God do this? Did he cause it? Or at a lesser level, did he allow it? Did he permit it? And in either case, why would he do that? If he's a good God. And there will be people who call it quits with God over a disaster like this and say, I can't believe in a good God who lets such things happen. I have met many Jewish people who have said that about the Holocaust. They can no longer believe in the God of Israel who allowed six million people to perish in the Holocaust. It's a major question and I want to answer that before tonight is over. But let's feel our way more carefully into disasters generally. Why do they continually happen in our world? History is just one disaster after another. Hardly a week goes by without a major unexpected loss of life. Well, let's begin by asking about the causes of disasters. And I divide them into two groups and then divide those two groups into two further subdivisions. On the one hand, there are disasters for which God may be held responsible. And on the other hand, there are disasters for which man is responsible. And I don't apologize to feminists for using the word man because most human disasters are caused by the male gender of the species. It is men on the whole who cause the disasters due to human origin. Now within those two categories of disasters which, for which God is responsible, over which we have had no control whatever, there are two subdivisions and it's important to get this clear in our minds. There are those for which he is indirectly responsible which means those which he allows to happen but didn't make happen. And there are those for which he is directly responsible which he caused to happen and which resulted in huge loss of life. We're going to have to rethink our understanding of God before we're through because he is a God who would do that. And if our concept of God has problems with that then we ought to ask, is our concept of God right? Let's take what I mean by the indirect responsibility of God. And I refer to natural disasters caused by one of the four basic elements, earth, air, fire and water. The earth produces earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and other disturbances over which we have no control whatever. There is no human factor involved. The air produces cyclones, tornadoes, which do immense damage. Fire, I've been personally a witness to a bush fire that was traveling through Australia at 60 miles an hour, jumping from the oil of one eucalyptus tree to the next, and for which there was no defense, except to get in your car and try and keep it 70 miles an hour. And then there is water, floods on the one hand, drought on the other, which every year cause hundreds if not thousands of deaths. Now I believe these are the indirect responsibility of God in that the earth and everything in it is his creation and he has made the earth and even though we may speculate that something has gone terribly wrong, yet God is ultimately in control of nature. And he does not prevent these things happening. And therefore, we can hold him responsible for them. Added to that, we can think of bacteria and epidemics, the Black Death that wiped out a quarter of the population of Europe, or the AIDS epidemic in Central Afri Africa at this very moment. These again are indirectly the responsibility of God. This is the creation he has made. 
that is behaving contrary to our interests. But then there are disasters for which God has been directly responsible, causing huge loss of life, which he himself directly produced. Noah's flood is the outstanding example, which resulted in the entire population of the then known world losing their lives prematurely, apart from one family of eight people. And God directly did that to the human race. He was directly responsible for causing it. Centuries later, he was responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem, which caused intense loss of life. It was a terrible event, but he did it. So here we have a whole area of disasters for which God may be held responsible either indirectly through nature or directly in which case he would use either nature or nations to accomplish his purpose but he accepted full responsibility as their direct cause now let me say straight away that I believe the events this week while you may say they were the indirect responsibility of God were not the direct responsibility I do not believe that he caused this but that he did permit it. That still is a question which we must face, but at least we're getting the question right. And if you can get the question right, you'll get the answer right. However, I have to admit that already Christian leaders have proclaimed publicly that God was directly responsible. Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, two of the best-known figures, associated with what's known as the moral majority in America, have both come out boldly and clearly. They believe that this was the judgment of God on America and particularly cited the abortion rate and a number of other sins of which America is guilty. Now, I don't believe that they are right. God allowed it to happen in the sense that he could have stopped it and he didn't but I don't believe he caused it. And I have one very simple reason for saying that. When God directly visits a disaster on people as a punishment for their moral behavior, he always gives a warning beforehand. Indeed, the prophet Amos says quite clearly that God always sends his prophet to warn people so that they may escape by repenting of the sins that are leading to the disaster and God gave no warning whatever I didn't hear of a single prophetic voice in the entire world warning people before this happened God is just and fair and he always gives warning before he acts in direct judgment that's characteristic of him indeed what comes across is his incredible patience even after he has given warning he can wait up to a thousand years before he brings the judgment he has promised. That's what happened in the days of Noah. Because Enoch had a son with an amazing name, Methuselah. And it means when he dies it will happen. And Enoch was the prophet who warned about Noah's flood coming. And Noah was his grandson. And his son was given this extraordinary name so that when the boy went to school and the teacher said, what's your name? When he dies, it'll happen. All right, when he dies, it'll happen. Have you done your homework? That was his name that he was landed with. And yet that man lived 969 years. Everybody knows he was the oldest man ever. But did you know why he was? It was because God waited nearly a thousand years before bringing the flood that he promised to Methuselah's father. And it was Methuselah's grandson who, when Methuselah died, began to build a boat and saved his family and could have saved more had people listened. But they didn't. So that's one reason. And when God directly sends a disaster, it is always directly and clearly related to the people on whom the disaster falls. That is not the case with uh, the natural disasters I've listed. So let me say right away that my conviction is, having thought much about it, that while God was indirectly responsible for what happened this week, 
by allowing it, by not stopping it, as he could have done. But he was not directly responsible. We are not to see it as a direct judgment on America. Or Britain, for that matter, for there were many of our people involved as well. So, these are the causes of disaster. And I want to remo uh, move straight on now to why this disaster was just so significant, why it sent this universal shockwave around our planet, more so than perhaps any other. I would compare it to the sinking of the Titanic. That was the first major disaster of the 20th century that followed the rest of the century, right to the end of it, as you well know. And that was because that ship was the largest moving object man had ever made. It was the peak of technology at that time. It was also the most luxurious ship that ever sailed. Put that together, technology, luxury, and so confident were people, so arrogant were they, that one person, as you know, said God himself could not sink this ship. And it went down on its maiden voyage. That was the beginning of pricking the bubble of social evolutionary optimism with which the 20th century began and it colored the rest of the century it was followed very quickly by World War I and World War II and other disasters but that initial disaster of the 20th century in which only 1100 people died followed us right the way through and I believe the events of this week can be parallel to that the world has changed quite radically this week for one thing, it's become a good deal less safe for all of us. But something has happened this week which we somehow feel and know is a turning point and could follow us through this century. So what is it made it such a big shock? Well, let's start in a very simple way. Information technology was the first thing that made this such a universal shock. You see, instead of hearing about a disaster days later, as in the case of the Titanic, we watched it happen. Television made us experience the thing. We were part of it. From almost the beginning, we were in it. And that affects you far more profoundly than just hearing about a disaster, to see it with your own eyes as it happens. And some of those pictures that we've seen this week were incredible. Have you ever seen anything like it? We all remember where we were when Kennedy was assassinated, and I think we'll all remember where we were when we heard about this. Of all places, I was in a travel agent booking an airline ticket, and suddenly the entire staff were not with me, and they were talking to each other, and they just ignored me. And I thought, what's going on? And then I heard two planes have crashed, and then gra gradually it unfolded and they just stopped business. And so I had to leave the shop and dash home and see what was really happening. We will all remember. But that's because we saw and we heard mobile phones enabled us to hear the last words of people dying on the plane, in the tower. We heard it. We saw it. We experienced it. And so disasters now become part of everybody's visual and audible experience. Almost immediately they happen. And so we live in the horror. But that's not the total explanation. But it's part of it. And the world will go on doing the same. Every disaster will now be brought home to us vividly and immediately and universally. The whole world knew about it within hours. Secondly, it was the disparity between the cause and effect. Two enormous buildings housing normally 50,000 people, collapsed like a pack of cards, and the headquarters of, of American military might, the Pentagon, just collapsed. And it was less than 20 men armed with pen knives. Somehow, there, there's a gap in our thinking. How could a little bunch of men with pen knives, with no greater weapons, pull down two of the biggest, costliest, and strongest buildings in the world. That, that was just a horror. And that made us feel very much less safe. 
over 5,000 dead, 20 men with pen knives. The whole thing seems almost impossible to believe and accept. And the early shock made us think, how could they possibly have done that? The third reason I've written down is that it happened to America. America, not only the richest, but the most powerful nation in the world, and until now thought to be the safest. With their Star Wars, with their missile umbrellas, with, with all the might at their disposal, you'd have thought that country was reasonably safe. Perhaps the safest in the world, the most protected. And now suddenly it appears to be the most vulnerable. That again made it a shock. If they're not safe, none of us are. And somehow that came home to us in a fresh way. A fourth reason, the potential fallout from this. We cannot guess at this stage, less than a week after, what the fallout is going to be. But the implications are ominous. The war talk is ominous. This could, could ultimately lead to Third World War, depending on how the Americans react and what they do about it. But there's war talk. And it's not a coincidence that America is likening this to Pearl Harbor, a declaration of war. The problem is they knew who did Pearl Harbor, but they don't know who did this. And that's one of the greatest problems. It's not going to be a normal war, whatever is done. It cannot be. The commercial and financial implications are horrific. Your savings and your pension will undoubtedly be affected. Here was the center of world trade and in an economy that was already tottering, this could be a severe major blow, if not a fatal blow. It could lead to a worldwide recession. There are so many potential implications that could follow. The fear is not just of terrorism, but of what this act means and what it could lead to. And then I wrote down, the implications for those responsible for the act. First, those who planned it. It has obviously been planned over a long period, 18 months they say. It must have done. It is brilliantly planned. It is clever. It is highly intelligent to have been able to do all that with so few resources. Required great planning. But the planners must be all head and no heart, whatever. They must be intelligent, but they must also be utterly ruthless, heartless, and have an utter contempt for human life. And that human beings are capable of planning such an event is a shock to every human being. We'll say more about that later from the Christian angle. Then what about those who executed the plan? They not only had contempt for other people's lives, they had a contempt for their own. And that is part of the horror of this event. There is very little protection against those who are willing to commit suicide. As the kamikaze pilots of World War II reminded us, very little defense, because the one thing that you can rely on in your enemy is that he wants to preserve his life. But when you're up against an enemy that doesn't, and that is willing not just to be willing to lay down his life, but to decide to do it, and take as many others with him as he can, there's not much you can do. And you have to ask, what makes a man reach that position? That he's willing to rob himself of everything that life has to offer and take as many other people with him. There is much more in this whole thing, however, that meets the eye. It is not just a single event between a handful of wicked men and a whole lot of innocent people. It's very much more than that. And I want just briefly to explore the wider picture. It is part of a clash between two entirely different cultures and ways of life. Whether we know the exact criminals or not, and 
or can name them or not. We have our suspicions. Nevertheless, it seems very clear that this has come out of the Islamic world. And the one thing that is very clear is that what has been done reveals a hatred, an extraordinary hatred of one culture for another, of one way of life for another. And the question that must be asked and faced honestly by the politicians and others is why is America so hated? There was a shock when the BBC discussion under David Dimbleby revealed strong anti-American feelings here. There was a behind-the-stage crisis last night at the last night of the proms when those who were singing and playing learned that the Stars and Stripes would be hung alongside the Union Jack at the last night of the proms. The one extrovert patriotic event which we still seem to have. And so there is an anti-American feeling very widely, but it is focused and concentrated in the Islamic world to a greater extent than anywhere else. And many Arabs are urging the Americans to ask the question, why do you think we hate you so much? And this, of course, is an extreme example of that hatred, this event, but it's very general. Is it envy for their wealth and power? No. Something deeper than that. It's the way they have used that, especially in the Middle East. And now we bring a third nation into the picture because we cannot see this event as simply a tension between the Islamic world and America. We must bring in the nation of Israel because that is the point of conflict and confrontation behind this whole event. That is the point at which American foreign policy is hated in the Middle East because her wealth and her military might have been firmly, openly placed at the disposal of Israel, which is that part of the Middle East utterly different to the Islamic world. When I say a difference of culture or civilization, we need to understand that difference. For one thing, the Islamic world is a world of dictatorships, some of them benevolent, some of them malevolent, some of them good, some of them bad. But it's a world of autocracy. It is not a world of democracy. America believes in democracy and will fight for it and defend it to the last ditch. Israel is a democratic country in an autocratic environment. It's a little bit of the West that has been intruded into the Middle East. And there are two very different ways of life in confrontation here. Another huge factor is that in the Islamic world there is no separation of religion and politics. And we must understand that if we're going to feel our way into understanding this crisis. There is no separation between religion and politics in Islam. The two are totally combined in the Quran and are applied to society as much as the individual. Whereas America, even though it is a Christian country in many ways, even though it probably has more Christians in it than any other country in the world, nevertheless stands for the separation of religion and politics. That means that in the West, in democratic countries, there is a concept known as the just war. War can be justified under certain circumstances. But in Islamic countries, a war is a holy war. Now, Christians have been taught by Jesus never to use force in the service of their faith. It may be justified in the defense of a country. It is never justified either to promote or defend the faith. Alas, Christians have fallen well below that, notably in the Crusades, which are still remembered throughout the Middle East, even though they took place a thousand years ago. Christians, in the name of Jesus and under the sign of the cross, slaughtered Muslims and Jews all the way from Europe through to Jerusalem. 
We need to remember that. Christians fell way below the standards that Jesus set. But in theory and in theology, Christians do not believe that force should ever be used to defend the faith or to promote it. But it's a little different in the Islamic world. There is a huge debate going on in, in the Islamic world right now. You will hear it on your radio. They're interviewing various mullahs and imams about it. They're all debating whether what has happened came under the heading of holy war, came under the heading of jihad. For the criminals concerned, it did. And we shall find that that enabled them to face suicide with joy. Indeed, some suicide bombers have been seen, recorded on television, as smiling as they set off the bomb that would kill them and many others. They were filled with joy while they did it. And some of us were sickened by the expressions of corporate joy, seeing Palestinians rejoicing and celebrating in the streets over what happened. But we need to understand why. Not just shrink from it in horror and say what sick people, but we need to understand why. Why has America backed Israel in the Middle East? Because that is the cause of the hatred that came later and is now spreading. The first reason undoubtedly is that they are committed to supporting democracy wherever it's threatened in the world. And they have the money and the power to do so. Look at the forces they have in the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean. They are right there in the Middle East, ready to act to defend democracy. And Israel is a democracy. Ironically, the Bible is not. Old Israel was not a democracy and was never intended to be. The Bible is not democratic. The Bible believes in a kingdom in which the king rules, in which there's no democracy, no elections, no parliament, no discussion, no debate, in which the king makes the rules and his subjects live by them. That is what we are made for. That is what one day we Christians will live in. Indeed, to a degree, we already live in that. The kingdom of heaven is not a democracy. But the idea in America is that the Bible is democratic and that democracy is the Christian form of government. It is no such thing. I remember seeing the Ten Commandments, the film, and Cecil B. DeMille, the producer, came on at the beginning and made a speech in which he said, this film shows the beginnings of democracy under Moses. And I didn't think Moses was a Democrat, and I don't think he made the Ten Commandments, and I don't think there was any debate over them. Democracy is not a Christian concept. I would agree with Churchill. Democracy is the worst possible form of government except all the others. And I think he was exactly right. What he meant was it is a safer form of government because it protects people against evil kings and dictators. And even Israel in the Bible had more bad kings than good kings who led the country into endless trouble. But there is this, America is defending Israel because it's a de democracy in the Middle East where there is so little. And wherever there is democracy, they feel they must step in and support it and protect it. But there's much more than that. There are more Jews in New York than in Israel. Many more. And they are a very influential lobby in American politics. And no presidential candidate can ignore the Jewish vote. They are a pressure group. And so America has to take note of that because it is a democracy and depends on the votes of Americans, including millions of Jewish people. But there is another factor in America which brings pressure to bear on the American government, and that's a Christian pressure. Perhaps the majority of evangelical Christians in America are convinced that Israel, in the purposes of God, has a right to that land that God gave them. And the major support of Israel in the Christian world comes from American evangelicals and some in this country, though not many. So again, the American democratic government, by the people, for the people, of the people, must take note 
of the large Jewish contingent in America and the equally large Christian contingent, perhaps even larger, that is pro-Israel. So you can see, I think, and understand why America has poured money and military arms into Israel. But I think you can also see why this should be a tremendous offense to the countries of the Middle East. It is a misfit politically, but it's also a misfit spiritually. And there are religious undertones in this whole conflict which we cannot avoid thinking about. There are three religions involved. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And they are all related. They all came out of each other. Furthermore, they all look to Jerusalem as a holy or special city. Furthermore, they are the only three monotheistic religions in the world. That long word means they all believe in one God. The Hindus believe in 30 million gods or manifestations of God. The Buddhists don't believe in any God at all. But the three religions that believe in one God are Islam, Judaism and Christianity. But they are incompatible with each other. Especially Islam and Christianity are contradictory. They cannot both be true. If one is true, the other is false. And that is one of the problems we have in this age of relativism where loose, sloppy thinking says all religions are the same and they're all seeking the same God and all heading to the same goal. That is sloppy thinking which has never studied any of the three at any depth. They are incompatible, even though they are related. Judaism has its prophets from Abraham through Moses and so on. But then... Christianity has the same prophets plus one, Jesus. But then Islam has all those prophets plus one, Muhammad. But Islam says that the records we have in our Bibles are not true records. And so they are able to contradict the things that Christians believe about Jesus. For example, that he was crucified. They don't believe that and say it was somebody else who looked like him who was mistaken for him. They are able to contradict the earlier prophets because they say the records we have of them, they even say that we wouldn't have four Gospels contradicting each other. We would only have one if we had the truth about Jesus. That's part of their apologetic or at least criticism of our faith. So you see, there they are. They all came out of the Middle East. They all claim many of the same prophets. They have many features in common. Islam believes in heaven and hell and the day of judgment. They believe in the Messiah who's coming back. They believe all that. Where did they get it from? Well, of course, Muhammad was in contact in his earlier years with both Jews and Christians, though the form of Judaism and the form of Christianity that he encountered put him off for life. But he picked up some of the things and incorporated them. So here we have a tripartite tension throughout the Middle East that has religious undertones. Now the big debate going on in the Islamic world right now is whether the Quran justified what happened in New York and Washington. Whether the Quran teaches, and it does teach, that force may be used in a holy war and the most serious aspect of the teaching is that those who die in a jihad, in a holy war, will be very greatly rewarded by God. One of the differences between Islam and Christianity is that Islam has no assurance of forgiveness. People hope that they will pass the judgment on the last day, but they don't know. There is only one way of being sure and that is to die as a martyr in a holy war. And when I made a list of the things that are promised to a martyr in a holy struggle, in a jihad, it is an extraordinary list. Seven rewards are offered. Seven being the perfect number. And here are the rewards for a person who dies in a holy battle. Number one. Forgiveness of all sins, 
absolutely assured. It is the only way that a Muslim can be absolutely sure that all his sins are forgiven. Secondly, a reserved place in paradise. Absolutely reserved. Thirdly, crowned with glory. Fourthly, and this is the one that will strike us as the misfit, 72 beautiful virgins to have sex with. Now imagine a man being offered that and believing that it's going to happen. Fifthly, he will be spared the suffering of the grave, meaning no more pain after death of any kind. Six, spared the horror of the day of judgment, he will not stand before God. And seven, that he can bring 70 relatives with him to paradise and name 70 of his extended family who will then be sure of heaven. Now I want you to imagine a man who really believes all that. He will be more than willing to lose his life. He has so much to gain. Now the debate that's going on is whether all that applied to these terrorists or not. And many Muslims horrified by the event are pulling back and saying that these promises have been taken out of context or that they're metaphorical and not literal. Or I've heard a number of different ways where they're trying to say we would not support that application of the teaching. But nevertheless it's there. And it's there for fundamentalists and extremists to apply to themselves. And there's no doubt that this teaching is being applied in the camps that are training terrorists. And we need to understand that's what you're up against. We're used to terrorism, alas, now in this country, mainly in Northern Ireland, but London itself hasn't escaped. We're used to that. What we're not used to is terrorists who are willing to commit suicide as they do it. If they kill themselves with a bomb in the British Isles, they've done it accidentally. They didn't want to, they didn't mean to, they wanted to kill others. But suicide terrorism is a new dimension and a new feature. There is one other thing I want to say about Islam. Islam is a territorial religion. Now what do I mean by that? Christianity and Islam both have a universal missionary ambition. Both want to spread their faith throughout the entire world. Judaism is not at the moment a missionary religion. It's all they can do to keep it going themselves. So many Jews are marrying out, as they say, that Judaism itself is under threat in a country like England. But nevertheless, both Islam and Christianity have an ambition to take the world for their faith. However, they think differently about it. While the primary mission of Christianity is seen as bringing individuals into the kingdom and hopefully enough individuals to make a difference as salt and light in society, Islam is territorial as well as individual. And it thinks in terms of land, land gained. Israel is also territorial. Christianity isn't. Israel is tied to land so is Islam. And Islam believes that it must conquer lands for Allah. And when a land has been conquered for Allah, it becomes holy to Allah. And most seriously, when any land that has once belonged to Allah is taken into infidels' hands again, then a holy war must be fought to regain that territory for Allah. Are you beginning to understand now what an offense Israel is in the Middle East? For centuries it was Allah country. From very quickly after Muhammad, Palestine, as the Romans called it, became a Muslim country. The Dome of the Rock was built. The Mosque Al-Aqsa was built. Mosques were built all over the country, which are still there. But it no longer belongs to Allah. 
And mark my words, Jerusalem is the heart of the problem. And nothing will be settled. Peace will not come until Jerusalem question is settled. That's the rock of offense according to the prophets of Israel. And it is. You may have heard that Muhammad ascended to heaven from Jerusalem. He did no such thing. He was never in Jerusalem. The reason why it is the third holiest city for Islam is very simple. He had a dream one night and dreamt that he ascended from Jerusalem to heaven on a white horse and returned the same night. And it was a dream. You'd be amazed how many Muslims think it actually happened. It's a kind of reflection of the true ascension of Jesus from that city. But there it is. And so it has become the third holiest city after Medina and Mecca. Here we have the very heart of the tension of the Middle East. About a year ago when uh, Sharon visited the uh, Temple Mount and the troubles, the present wave of terrorism trouble began. People asked me about it and I said, this time it won't finish. Because for the first time, Jerusalem is at the top of the agenda. For the first time, the Palestinians and the Arabs generally have used the word Jerusalem in their demands. Jews have sworn that it will be the eternal capital of their nation and country because God willed it to be. And of course, for Christians... Many Christians say, we don't care who has Jerusalem as long as we can go and take pictures. I'm afraid that is the attitude of many Christians in this land. But listen, where do you think Jesus is coming back to? If he comes back bodily as he's promised to return, he must come to one place. He can't come to the whole world at once. If he's coming back as he left in his body, he can only come to one place. And the prophets of the Old Testament... Tell us exactly where that will be. The Mount of Olives, the place he left. He's coming back to Jerusalem. So that puts the Christian interest in the tension. We can't just say, oh, let the United Nations take it over and everything will be settled. It's not as simple as that. So there we have it. I've spoken about uh, disasters generally and how we respond to them, the phases of our response. I've spoken about the causes of them, which we may attribute to divine responsibility and which to human responsibility, though in both cases there is a direct and an indirect. And I did forget to tell you about the indirect disasters caused by humans. I refer to things like train crashes, Paddington, and plane crashes, Concord, where there was no intention to cause the disaster, but where human ignorance or negligence or folly was responsible for the disaster. So again, there's an indirect responsibility allowing something to happen in the direct responsibility, both in the divine and the human sphere. Now I think at that point we could have a break and a song, even though you may not feel much like singing. Let's just have a break and stretch your legs and then let's look at some of the things the Bible says about such disasters. <laughs>